Um, hello and welcome to our session on developing capability for workplace innovation. My name is Anahita. I'm an associate professor at Nipissing University's School of Business. Um, I'm joined here today by my colleague, Dr. Tom Carey, who some of you might remember from his previous role at University of Waterloo as Associate VP for Teaching and Learning, since he is the co-catalyst for Workplace Innovation Network for Canada. At Workplace Innovation Network for Canada, we work with our workplace partners to, um, um, to as they move towards the goal of every employee contributing to workplace innovation. We also work, um, we also support our academic partners as they move towards the goal that every graduate can be an innovation enabler, both within the workplace and in their roles as community members and global citizens. To learn more, please um, um, check our WinCan website. If you please share the link in the chat box, it's going to be there. Thank you. Um, so here is the agenda for today, where we are going to um, present to you the modules we are developing on workplace innovation um, through the VLS funding. And we are going to um, discuss an opportunity for collaboration towards the end of the session. If you're interested to learn more about some of our other efforts, a one page capsule history will be dropped in the uh, chat box if you please share it, thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned, we are currently working on developing two modules through the VLS funding on workplace innovation. The modules contain uh, conceptual content on workplace innovation and they, uh, they have a context. We have given them a context through use of uh, different cases, stories, and learning activities. As a result, um, we are hoping that they lead to um, organizational capability for workplace innovation. Uh, we can explore them in more details now. So just to be on the same page, workplace innovation is the employee-led social process of mobilizing new ideas to create better work. The twin goals um, uh, of workplace innovation are um, to improve organizational performance for the employer and um, quality of work life for the employees, so really a win-win situation. In our first module, learners will learn about a series of activities by which employees can choose to be um, actively engaged in workplace innovation. The simplest form is job crafting, which involves only um, an employee and the manager. It's on the low end of team size and complexity, team size and diversity, complexity and uncertainty. Job crafting is a social process, um, is a social process where employees, they get to craft their roles from different aspects, such as um, skills, tasks, or relations. The skills developed in job crafting can then be applied um, in more complex forms of workplace innovation. I should also mention that um, in our specific module, we have developed an assignment on job crafting where, where learners get to uh, craft their roles as, le as learners within the university uh, slash course as their workplace. Um, so moving on to more um, complex forms of job crafting, we can look at innovation adaptation, design innovation, or entrepreneurship. Innovation adaptation is where the employees or learners, they look at uh, the external, their external workplace to see if there are any innovations that can be adapted and how they would work within their uh, workplace. And then there is design innovation that I should also need, that I should also add that uh, design, uh, design thinking falls under the category of uh, design innovation. Uh, when we are adopting these modules at Nipissing University, we have created an experiential learning opportunity in collaboration with our co-op coordinator um, um, for our students. And we um, encourage other um, educators or institutions adopting these modules to um, develop um, other relevant experiential learning opportunities for their learner, uh, learners incorporating these contents. Um, here we have really a snapshot of an early prototype of the modules. Um, shout out to our great team who have been working on these. Um, as you can see, we um, have adopted a number of case stories and videos. Um, some of them are from our colleagues in workplace, in workplace innovation. Europe, this is a specific one. 
um, is from the um, a public UK, a public British agency, uh, the National Meteorological Weather Office. Um, so the, the case stories that we have adopted, they are from various contexts. Um, and um, with regards to various aspects of workplace innovation, we have coupled this specific one in the course with another case uh, from a Spanish manufacturing firm. And of course, in addition to the case stories to illustrate the concepts, uh, the modules contain practice cases in which the students test their understanding. Um, over to you, Tom. Thanks, Anahita. Um, so the two modules that we're building now for eCampus Ontario are the two blue modules shown on the screen. The one at the beginning, which gives an overview of the idea of employees engaging in workplace innovation and what the individual capability for that would be, as Anahita has just walked you through. The closing module looks more at what does an organization need in order to encourage, support, recognize, and reward a more innovative workforce. And the way that's framed for students is what kind of organization do you want to look for that can take advantage of your full capability? So those are the two modules we're building now um, for eCampus Ontario. In the middle, kind of the meat in the sandwich or the beyond beef or you, whatever you like in your sandwich, that's the experiential learning activity. That's where the students actually engage in projects using our own teaching and learning workplace as the workplace for as a workplace for learning. So all of those experiences have to be authentic. It can't be just an assignment that I do in the course because I have to, you know, it's no impact on my life after the course ends. So, uh, as Anahita already mentioned, the job crafting experiment that they engage in can be done in this course, but it's better done in a different course in which they work to create a self-directed learning exercise to learn one of the outcomes in the course. And that's meant to illustrate for them this notion of workplace innovation meeting two goals. <clears throat> meeting the goal of improving organizational performance, which in our case as higher ed institutions means achieving the institutional learning outcome set for the course. And then the second objective is always to improve the employee's quality of work life. So in terms of students creating a self-directed assignment, but that means something that has more intrinsic value for you outside of the grade you might get in the course. Does this help you to develop a skill that you really want? Does this utilize your existing strengths and so on? Um, so in addition to developing a set of skills, as Anahita outlined on the previous slide, those exercises are intended to build the mindset of an innovator. You should note that unlike, say, an entrepreneurship course, which might reach only, what, 5% of our students on campus, what we're aiming for here is another graduate attribute, something which all of our students should develop in terms of the mindset as an innovative employee and in their other roles as community members and global citizens. Uh, so if you think of this now as a, a really scalable effort, <clears throat> our largest class to date has had uh, 193 students. I happen to know that because I marked 50 of their reflection papers yesterday. Um, so this is intended to be something which a large proportion of our students could access. Okay, let's go on and do that. Um, so this is an example, thank you. This is an example of one of those projects. Um, 
So there's job crafting in which the students and their manager, that is typically an instructor, negotiate a new way of carrying out the work. This goes up one step in terms of complexity and team size. So an innovation adaptation exercise, there is a challenge which our organization is trying to solve. There is a potential solution elsewhere, which we are considering bringing in. And we need some systematic way to determine how will this work here? And if so, how will we have to adapt it to change it? And what we're inviting you to do in the workshop today is to think about this whole course as itself an innovation, which you might adapt in your own institution. And again, you can get students to help you with that. So the example that uh, on the previous slide is one that we use <clears throat> with our research university partner. The client is the person who runs the university's uh, leadership program for students, which is a co-curricular program outside of the credit courses. And um, the students were looking at solutions elsewhere to see you know, were there ideas there that they could develop and could those solutions be adopted. So, and he mentioned that in the Nipissing course, which is going kind to of start in January, the client is a staff member who runs the co op work program for students. And the design challenge she's presenting is. How can I get more students to take up these co-op work placements? We have more placements than students who to take them, which uh, is somewhat unusual, and she wants to not lose any of those possible employees. Okay, thanks, Andy. On to the next slide. Okay, that use of clients who are educators outside of the normal instructional pool, so people in career prep, uh, librarians, people from uh, learning design and scholarship and teaching learning areas, all of those folks have been working with us. So if this is going to scale to reach a large number of our students, we're really going beyond the traditional educator roles to help out with that. So there are the instructional roles. We have worked with some faculty to assist us in adapting case stories to a particular work domain. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, another role is for an instructor in another course to say, yes, I'd be glad to have a student do a job crafting exercise in my course, or I would be glad to have a student team who could work with me in looking at an innovation from another institution that I could try in one of my own courses. So if any of your institutions are engaged in student as partners activities, this is a reframing of students as partners, because rather than putting on their resume, I was part of a students as partners project or a faculty member, they can say, in developing my innovation capabilities that I'm going to bring into your workplace, I worked with a client on the following kind of project. Um, so identifying more of those posts and clients uh, if you're from a teaching and learning center, then working with us on the learning design or in helping the faculty member to create a scholarship and teaching and learning project. And then uh, what else do we have on there? And indeed, I think look, helping us to engage with external partners in working with the learning. So we have a sketch of the business case. We work with Ripen to create a couple of sample um, job descriptions. So uh, in all of those ways, you might work with us. So the next slide. Andy. So I mentioned program specific adaptations for a particular work domain. So the project at Nipissing, uh, our student research assistant happened to be from accounting. And so she helped us to create some uh, sample cases that illustrate the practices we're looking at. So, in the modules, there are illustration cases built in, such as that Met Office case that was up on one of the earlier slides. There are practice cases that you do online and get some feedback, uh, since you self-assess uh, test for you. 
And then there are the actual project cases in which you do the authentic experiential learning. So we would really like to have illustrative and practice cases that target particular work teams. You might want to help us with that. Um, next slide, Andy. In addition, each of your institutions has its own particular context. So here are some examples of context we're working in now. I already mentioned uh, Faculty of Arts at a research university which has this as a one semester course. Uh, the Nipissing example is from a business school at a smaller university, and it's actually half a semester course. And this course is on creativity and innovation in the workplace. So there's, a, there's not as much opportunity for students to carry out those experiential learning activities. The long-term plan there is to have micro-credentials available such that the students could take this course and then complete various work assignments over time. And, uh, we're working with one college in Ontario that's exploring that with a particular interest in trying it out in uh, their post bac programs. A one year program with a week, intensive week up front and intensive week at the end that would lead into workplace projects. And, uh, we're also in discussions with a polytechnic institution it has a liberal arts department, and they're thinking about what would this look like as an offering from uh, in liberal arts, but again, with micro-credentials where students can pursue assignments. So you can see here a real diversity of institutional types, and that's very typical of uh, an innovation project. We know that breakthrough innovations are much more likely if you have a number of collaborators who bring different perspectives, different contexts, different ways of thinking to the problem. So this is itself an innovation project. We would love to have a more diverse team than our current partners. Um, when we say collaborate with us, that includes obviously seeking external support and funding. We will all know that eCampus Ontario conveniently announced their second call coming up. And one of those is creating more and better content and there are top-ups available for uh, adaptations to your context and so on. So there's lots of opportunities there. In which we can work with. Future Skills Center, also we should have called last week. We're talking to two workplace partners at the moment on potential short uh, research grants. So um, we really want to now hand over to you folks. I know there are questions appearing in the chat box. And uh, if people want to raise them, please do it there. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. On the last slide, we've put up some of the student views from uh, our current offering in the research university. And it's been very rewarding for us to have the students express in their unprompted reflections how their own mindsets about innovation change. So it's not just a skills course. It's been a real eye opener for them in terms of what they could contribute to increase in the workplace. I'll stop, Anahita, you've been having a look at the chat. Thank you, Tom. So um, we actually have um, a comment in the chat box um, and um, we welcome any questions or other comments. Um, so feel free to type away. Um, so uh, it's a comment from Tanya from York University, I understand. We are a professional learning unit here at York U. We call them um, action learning projects. They are non-credit micro-credentials with a digital badge. Um, and they say it sounds like a similar model to our work for in-house programs for employers, innovation. Um, and then they add for in-house programs for employers, innovation is usually the goal, right on. It's such a hot topic. Tanya, I would just add that uh, York's Lausanne School of Engineering was a partner with us on Ontario Skills Catalyst Fund grant 2018-19. And I actually started up another conversation at York last week. So uh, we should talk. So I don't know if you can see Tom, Tanya just responded, absolutely. 
So we are really interested to hear if you see there is any scope for um, collaboration or adaptations, or if you see any of what we are doing fits in your institution, in your course, or if you have any really comments that, that you think that we could improve our work, if there, are, there is anything out there that um, we could look into. Um, I see so Lauren Harrison's comment. Uh, Yes, let, let, let me read it for everyone. Were you, um, Tom, were you, uh, were you suggesting that these innovation skills would be considered undergrad uh, degree level expectations, as we would call them, competencies? Uh, absolutely, Laurie. Uh, we're using the word capability as opposed to competency. And uh, I can send you some of the references on that. We picked up some of those ideas in Australia where they talk about job knowledgeable, job ready, and job capable. So job knowledgeable, you've learned all this stuff, but you haven't actually applied it yet. Job ready, you have some experiences which are applicable. And that's kind of the minimum we would want to achieve with the students in the authentic learning experiences here. But job capable means you have the big picture of context, that's why we have that module on organizational capability. Um, and you also have the mindsets. So you think of yourself as an innovator. You have a sense of self-efficacy, of confidence in your ability. And you also understand your own motivation, uh, both intrinsic and extrinsic, for engaging with innovation. So we would call it a capability, but we would definitely put it into the category of something that every graduate should have to engage with the future work, both to cope with it, but also to help shape it. Yeah, so that framework uh, that I just mentioned, the uh, job ready, job knowledgeable, job capable is from uh, my colleague, Lena Marcus guy at the University of Sydney. And I can send you uh, her most recent paper that talks about that. Other thoughts, uh, other thoughts from people in terms of if we were going to do that at our institution, um, here's where we might run a pilot study. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, of course, at the course that I mentioned at the research university, uh, 40 students in the prototype last year, we had 200 registered this year, 192 complete. We're supposed to have 400 next year and that's a completely online course which i would never have tried to do without doing it face to face first except for the pandemic which as all of you know made us do a lot more work and has worked it's been a scalable success but what we're looking for now are pilot studies obviously but a much smaller scale than other institutions with them material Um, Tom, do you want to speak about the possible adaptation to various workplaces um, um, like that, the healthcare industry that we were looking into? Yeah. So we've had discussions with a number of employers. And again, in the capsule history, you can see more about that. Um, we're having a discussion currently with an institution we see about how could we work in a more systematic way with employers? And what we discovered is that our existing structures like program advisory committees and co-op office and so on, aren't really well set up for that. Big employers who might take a lot of our co-op students aren't necessarily the ones who are pioneering of innovation in the workplace. And it's not as if, as in a program advisory committee, an employer could say, here's what we need. You know, here's our national occupational for project managers in the electricity sector. Uh, 
mention that because that's the one National HR Council will look at. Our employer partners are inventing this as they go along as well. So we have an opportunity to work hand in hand on this and develop it together as a new area we think could be of strategic importance for Canada. Leaders here are in Europe. Our research base really is only 10 years old. But the Europeans have not made that link between higher ed and the workplace. And I think we have a real opportunity to fill some of these. Thank you. Right. Um, I would also like um, to add that we are looking into potential ways to me measure the impact of um, this work, the, the modules we have looked at, um, and at least at the way we are delivering it at Nipissing, we are looking into um, handing out uh, an innovation, motivation for innovation um, uh, scale to our students to fill out before and after the course. Um, really for them to reflect on what they have learned and for us to get a better understanding of how much impact this has made. Um, so it, it would be actually really interesting um, if we could come back to you next year and share the results um, of um, how it was received and um, what impact we think or the students think they made and share more feedback with everyone. <laughs> uh, just to pursue that, uh, the research that we're applying there is from a researcher at Queen's University, Terry Soleus, who's in health sciences. He's the director of health science. His PhD was in fact with education on what motivates innovators. That's a really fine piece of research. I'm happy to share that. Couple people have emailed me. <laughs> My email bell has gone off. So we're looking forward to collaborating with you on so feel free to email us and, uh, and or put your comments in the chat space. Um, so we have another question, Tom. What are your thoughts about universities embedding professional certificates as a core part of the curriculum and adding the qualifications slash certification as part of their final exam? Um, yeah, that's certainly easier in a college or polytechnic setting. Well, obviously, our professional programs uh, universities are more used to doing that. Found one way to finesse that um, in, our, in a couple of the current instantiations of these materials. There's an exercise which student can choose to do, and there's a lot of student choice in which you know what particulars of the assignment they can come. One of the options they're given is in an exercise on. Oh, we lost you. It's. You'll have to carry it. Oh, oh, we got it back. Okay. One of the exercises that students can choose to do is to study how a particular method, design thinking, is done at scale in uh, large multinational enterprises. And they actually take the IBM design thinking digital badge curriculum at the practitioner level, which is the introductory level. And then they write a reflection paper on it. So we don't require them to do that. And even if they work their way through the badge, we don't require them to get the professional certification, but it is an option. Having written your reflection paper and completed the digital badge, IBM will award you something you can put on your LinkedIn page and your Facebook. Both Anahita and I did that, and uh, uh, every student who's ever done that assignment has, of course, opted to do the digital badge. So that's a kind of 
backdoor way to work that in. I shouldn't admit that the curriculum committee, you know, the Senate didn't have to approve that and say why that provider, et cetera. So uh, we have been somewhat innovative in the teaching methods of the course. I've said. I, I believe our time is up. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. And um, we are always happy to chat. If um, the topic of today's session interests you, so please do get in touch. And again, a big thank you for, to eCampus for providing us with this opportunity. Thank you.